Uh, when, when we started to work with the blockchain, I discovered one of the true uh, ways of, of getting interesting work in a large company. You have to be enthusiastic, but a little skeptic. So if you say that, uh, oh, sounds great, but have you thought of, and then everybody says, oh, you need to join our project. And that's what I said when I came across blockchain for the first time inside Statoil. Um, and since then, we've been working in a number of initiatives. And based on those initiatives, we've taken away some learnings. And those are the learnings that I'm going to present to you today. So when, me when most of us think about blockchain, we think about bitcoins. Uh, bitcoins came around in 2009. It's a digital currency. Uh, and just like cash, it works directly between users. There is no central bank. Um, and of course, to most of us today that uses credit cards, this is a very alien concept, but some of us remember the old days of cash uh, and how you could uh, actually give money to somebody without anybody else finding out. And if you look at the underlying technology of, block, uh, of Bitcoin, the underlying technology, which is blockchain, it, it has a lot more potential usage areas than digital cryptocurrencies, because blockchain they create trust between unknown parties without the use of intermediaries or central authorities. So today, a lot of the, th uh, the things that we do digitally, they re rely on some central authority to, to, to make sure that everything is okay. Um, I, have, uh, I live in Norway. I'm the third Norwegian, you, so uh, all of the three Norwegians are speaking today. I don't know why. But um, uh, in Norway, the central authorities are quite good. I mean, we have a totally trustworthy state uh, and a totally trustworthy county, and they keep records of, of everybody who owns property and how much taxes we pay and all of these things. Uh, other countries, maybe not so much. And this is where we see that blockchain can be, or between parties in different countries, this is where we see that blockchain can have a big potential for us. Um, just, I'm not going to spend a lot of time explaining blockchain. There are lots of good online videos, YouTube and so on, that you can use to see the, to, if you want to understand blockchain better. But for the purpose of this presentation, I'll just explain briefly that Blockchain is about transactions that are grouped into blocks. So, we have Alice and Bob, our two friends from uh, crypto. Uh, Alice wants to send 5,000 whatevers to, uh, to Bob. And so they create a transaction. And that transaction then has a digital signature. Um, and then you can take a group of these transactions uh, and group them into a block. And that block has some identifying properties, and it, then it has a digital signature, and then it has a pointer to the previous block and the previous signature, um, which then, of course, points to the previous block. And how this works in practice depends on what kind of blockchain platform you're working on. If you're working with Bitcoin, it works in a certain way. If you work with Ethereum, it works in another way. And there are many, many, um, many, many different uh, cryptocurrencies and blockchain platforms out there. And they all work slightly different. But this is the, the, one of the promises of, of the, um, the blockchain paradigm. So, um, one of the things that <clears throat> could, you could easily imagine that reading about blockchain in the, in the papers, that this is the solution to all kinds of problems, because they promise you the world. They promise you to, they promise a Tesla Model Y, but uh, at the moment what technology can really deliver is a Ford Model T. So this is still early stages. This is why we deal with it in research uh, and not in, in reality or not in, in true implementations. Uh, we're seeing a lot of good concepts out there. We're seeing small implementations, but we're still yet to see those large scale implementations that can really change, change what we're doing. And if you go back and read the papers, you will see people claiming otherwise, but uh, let's have that discussion over beer. Um, in the automotive industry, it took about 100 years to get from the Model T to the Model Y. Uh, and in, it, in internet time, that means that a good blockchain implementation is probably 5 to 10 years away um, in large-scale uh, adoption and large-scale networks. 
so this is something that will probably happen within my professional career at least. Um, and if you look at the true, uh, the, the security of a blockchain uh, are based around three fundamental concepts. One of them is the proof of work, which is where you will find in the Bitcoin, you will find miners that can, um, that, uh, that calculates numbers that uh, exhibit certain properties. And then those numbers, they go together with the transactions into the linked chain. Uh, and so that chain with lots of uh, signatures and lots of uh, hashing and all of these things, create a link that is very hard to change because if you want to change something in the history of the chain, you have to recalculate all of the signatures and all of the hashings going forward. And given that the proof of work is so hard and keeps getting harder, you will never actually catch up with the, the current truth. The last and most difficult thing for most people to grasp is the concept of consensus. So there, and consensus comes from the old Byzantine generals problems where you would see that you had three, or in this case it's four, but uh, the last one is below, uh, below the, the surface. They wanted to attack um, the castle and so they wanted to make sure that all of them attack because if all of them attack, um, they will win. If one of them does not attack, they will lose. So before each general committed his resources and his things, uh, his soldiers to the problem, he wanted to make sure that all of the other generals as well was, um, was actually going to attack. And the problems of Byzantine fault tolerance are quite, it's a long studied topic in, in computer science. And, um, and it's, it just have to say that you have to pay, pay real attention to your consensus algorithm because if you do something and changes it from one of those things that are in common use in the open source platforms today, you will probably introduce some security weakness. And that also goes for proof of work. You will see, you will read about, um, uh, you will read about things like proof of authority and proof of something else, proof of stake. Um, which are perfectly good ways of, of uh, making sure that uh, everything stays secure. But you have to acknowledge that if you change the fundamentals, which are proof of work, linked chains, and consensus algorithms, if you change any of those, you will introduce security risks. And you will need to identify those security risks so that you can mitigate them. You don't have to mitigate them in technology. You can mitigate them in, in legal paperwork. Uh, if you are within a good jurisdiction, such as the US or the EU or something like that. So it's not impossible, you just have to be really careful. So, just a few examples of uses in the industry, in the energy industry, just to give you a flavor of what blockchain can truly do beyond uh, what, we're, uh, what we're looking at in the... beyond bitcoins. So. Uh, the first topic is something we call certificate of origin. Um, today, uh, you can buy, if you want to, uh, you can buy green energy, or you can buy uh, not so green energy, or you can buy dirty energy. Um, and today, it's a very manual, labor intensive uh, process, and it only works on large, num large batches. So if I, w if I go to my power provider back in, in Norway, the, the, the granularity of power that I can buy is not sufficient for me to say that my power is green. I only know that his, the power provider's energy is a mix of certain things. But in a future scenario, you might imagine that we would be able to track the individual kilowatt hours from the producers or from production through the transmission. And here you can see that we have taken the different, uh, this is of course simplified, but you can see that we have taken the different kilowatt hour blocks and distributed them to three different uh, distribution networks. And we know how many kilowatt hours from each source went into each network. And then you can do that all the way to consumption. So if I am, um, if I am the, the, the guy in the middle there, I know that my kilowatt hours all come from a green source. Um, 
and uh, and I know that nobody else has b bought those uh, those kilowatt hours either. So I know that these are mine. That I have used them. I have spent them. They will not be reused to claim some other people's green uh, conscience. Another very uh, interesting usage area that we have been looking at, and this is the topic that I volunteered to talk about after lunch, is how did we discover how to use blockchain with, to handle oil cargo ownership? Um, because if you look at the oil industry today, we operate with something called a bill of lading. And this is a physical paper. This particular paper is from uh, Thomas Jefferson's order of cigars to, to Paris in uh, way back when. Um, but uh, the, the point is that the physical holder of the bill of lading, he actually owns the cargo. Uh, and that means that we spend a lot of money on FedEx and DHL and UPS and whatever they are, physically shipping these documents around the world. Um, and the reason why we do this is that we want to avoid double spending. So if I sell an oil cargo to Linda, for instance, she will know that I do not sell the cargo to somebody else afterwards. And the, way, the only way that we have been able to do this today is by the use of physical bill of lading papers. We could do it by using central authorities or we could use it by using brokers and, and all of these things, but we don't want to because it gives the brokers and the central authorities insight into our business that we do not want them to have. But by using blockchains, we can, we can maintain that physical, we can maintain the equivalent of the physical ownership of the bill of lading paper uh, while still maintaining the information security that we want to do. Uh, this, I'll talk about more about this after lunch, but um, yeah. The last one um, is about uh, the machine network. Um, and this is about machines that are interacting directly with, with each other. Going back to the power example, today you have fairly big uh, power producers. So they are the power plants, the, 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 hydro, power, the hydro plants and all of these. And they send their uh, power through the trans transmission and distribution system operators to a set of consumers. And so there are quite a few uh, producers, but there are hundreds of millions of consumers. I think in Europe there is a, few, a couple of thousand producers. It's not that many. So today we have the processes in place we can, to handle a few producers and hundreds of millions of consumers uh, because we can all report it into some central authority. In Norway it's called uh, Statnet and they are responsible for balancing all, out all this to make sure that the, all the people get paid the right amount of money for the power that they have consumed or produced. Uh, from the consumers. Uh, but what we have seen, uh, and th the reason why I mention these three examples is that these are examples where we have working code, which is always interesting, because if you know that it works in code, then you know that your concepts are actually valid, and you know then there are other things you need to do to scale it beyond your little lab thing, but you, at least you know that the technology can be used in the way that you think it can be used. Sometimes you will only see PowerPoint presentations like this of somebody saying that you can use it for this or you can use it for that. Well, yeah, that's true. You can probably use blockchains for a lot of things, but these three things that I mentioned today, these are examples where we or somebody that we are collaborating with have working code. So that means that we know that this can be used. And so the purpose of, of this machine network is that instead of having a few producers and quite a lot of, um, of consumers, everybody can be a producer or a consumer and then they can, then they can have a, um, a small device in your home uh, that um, that, enable, that allows you to trade with your neighbors or the main network or whatever you wanted to, to trade with. And then it could have a wallet so that it can get, get paid automatically. So the, all the people that are involved today, they don't have to be involved anymore. And this opens up 
the possibilities of individual small producers and consumers. For instance, solar powered, where you have a solar panel on your roof and a small battery in your basement, that means that you can charge during the day and sell during the night or whatever you want to do. But the blockchain enables that, that mechanism of automated trading between small individuals in ways that we haven't seen today without the use of central authorities. If you want to do it today, you have to have some transmission uh, system operator or uh, distributor that handles all of the accounting for you. But the blockchain actually make it uh, possible to do it. And if you go back to the, um, to the Saturn in San Diego, which was in 2015, I believe, um, you will find a very good example. There is a good example video of how this could work uh, from two other guys, which I don't remember the name of. But they showed how to do this uh, with sound measurements where, you, where the microphones would buy power or you would buy capabilities from the microphones paying in bitcoins. We have other examples on, on based on Ethereum that, uh, that basically does the same thing. So, having been the technical blockchain lead for Statoil for 18 months, I've seen a lot of proposals. People are saying they are, are listening to the hype. They are coming out and saying that we want to start using blockchain for this or that. Um, and so, how do you triage all of these proposals? Well, you need to have some way of evaluating them. And what we have started to do is to uh, start, we have six areas that we are looking at. We're looking at the topics of trusted transactions. We are looking at transparency. We are looking at the usage of central authorities. We are looking at non-repudiation. We are looking at smart contracts and how it behaves. And we are looking at timing and performance. And these are very important aspects of blockchain usage that we all need to understand when you are evaluating the different proposals. Um, and so we will go through each of these six and hopefully it will give you something that you can take back to your company if you want to evaluate some proposals. First. First, uh, looking at what is the trusted transaction? Because sometimes when people are proposing, uh, proposing um, uh, blockchain initiatives, there is no transactions there. So and transactions can be one-sided. It's just something you want to publish to get it on the record, but it still has to be a transaction at the, at the foundation. If you don't have a, f uh, a transaction, it's not the blockchain problem. Um, because blockchain are based around trust and, uh, trusted transactions. And identifying those uh, transactions is the key to evaluating if this is a blockchain problem. The things that we have found that are very suitable are transactions between multiple counterparties that can be represented as financial transactions. For instance, in cryptocurrencies, or in crypto valence, such as the certificates of origination. It's not a Bitcoin or Ethereum thing, but there, so there is a special cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are quite easy to make. It takes you about five minutes to, to make one. That's why uh, uh, we have our in inter internal cryptocurrency in Statoil, which is called Cryptolium or Cryptolium. We haven't decided how to pronounce it yet. But uh, it's very useful to have your own cryptocurrency because you can use it for, for these experiments that you're using. The other thing that we have found that this is very useful is when we are exchanging information between uh, multiple counterparties, like the bill of lading example. Um, in addition to the bill of lading itself, you have all of the inspection reports and all of these things where you want to be able to prove beyond a doubt that something happened at a given time involving a set of very specific counterparties. Those are the type of transactions that we are looking for. Those are the transactions that are um, uh, suitable for to, to be solved with blockchain. Uh, you can use it for uh, one-sided publication of information on events, but uh, it's not that suitable. And if you're looking at blockchain and videos, which I've seen proposals on, I would say, ah, probably not. Um, and uh, so that is the first thing. If you can't identify the transaction, it's not a blockchain problem. Then, of course, if you were paying attention to Bitcoin, the Bitcoin hype uh, some years ago, one of, the, one of the big things about Bitcoins was it's supposed to be anonymous. 
but it isn't because you, all of your um, all of your uh, transactions are keyed to your wallet, and even though there is no link in itself between your wallet and your physical person, the still the ID of the wallet. And if you if you slip up and order pizza delivered to your home and pay in bitcoins, then there is a link between your wallet and yourself. So. <coughs> P blockchains are built to be very transparent as part of the trust model. Tr transparency, the ability of everybody to verify whatever happens on the blockchain. Because it's not like what happens, it's not like with Vegas, and what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, what happens on the blockchain is, is published to everyone. So everybody knows. And you can't change it afterwards either. You can make corrections, you can make corrective transactions, but when something is on the blockchain, it is there forever. So that means that the things that are very suitable are transactions that are public. So like record, uh, records of, um, of property and property transactions and all of these things are quite, um, uh, quite suitable. Uh, transactions that are private but where there is a digital uh, representation, for instance, a hash or something, that can be made public. Those are, those are suitable as well, but at the same time you open yourself up to all kinds of traffic analysis, especially in small networks. So if you have, um, if you have like the, the, the North Sea oil trading community, which has a couple of hundred maybe uh, participants, if you run uh, long-running analysis of the traffic between all of these participants, you can actually learn quite a lot. So even though you don't know the detail of the individual transactions, you can still, based on the transactions and the knowledge of the transactions that they are there, you can still infer a lot of knowledge. So these side channel attacks are something that you need to pay a particular attention to when you're looking at the transparency. Um, if uh, nothing is supposed to be public, then it's not a blockchain problem either. There are some blockchains that are um, that are claiming to be private or claiming to be able to do, do all kinds of things. But then, of course, that violates some of the security models. So then you have to do a, a thorough risk evaluation to see that the way that they are taking away the transparency does not introduce security risks that you don't want to have. So they, I'm not saying that it can't, you can't do it for, for uh, private transactions. I'm just saying that you need to be really careful so that you don't introduce security risks that you don't want to uh, that you don't want to have. Um, the third uh, area that we often evaluate is uh, around the use of central authorities. Um, blockchains, as I mentioned the uh, in the beginning, are made to provide trust without the use of a central authority, and that means that. If there is no central authority today, that can usually be, means it's a good uh, blockchain problem. Uh, or where there is um, uh, a central authority which is costly, time consuming, or cumbersome. Uh, for instance, like a stockbroker or a, uh, or, so, or a bank for that matter, uh, which are kind of, it takes a lot of time to be able to do things properly. Then those are the things where you can find that there are blockchain could be part of your new solution. Um, but sometimes the removal of the central authority doesn't really provide any value. And then it's probably not a blockchain problem either, because the, the central authorities are quite useful in some cases. So you have to make sure that the removal of the central authority actually gives you value. Uh, value. And sometimes you look at the banks and say that banks are running blockchain initiatives. Uh, and that usually means that the banks are trying to become a new central authority for your blockchain thing. And so you need to be very careful about how those banks are uh, being, uh, trying to, to stay in the market. Then, of course, there are other usage for, black, um, for blockchains that are very useful to the banks, where the banks can provide new kinds of services and new kinds of opportunities. So. I'm not saying that the banks should stay away from blockchain. I'm just saying that you need to look at what are what are the participants trying to be, because if they are trying to be to stay a central authority, 
then it is uh, probably not a good idea to to, imp to to introduce blockchains. But if it the use of blockchain into, um, uh, opens up new business models where you don't have to have a central authority, then it's probably a good idea. This uh, very difficult word for a non-native English speaker, non-repudiation. Uh, which means that I cannot deny that something has happened. Um, uh, and this is, uh, this is um, about making sure that if I have said something or if a transaction has been made, then neither of the participants can deny that this has happened uh, afterwards. Very important in the oil and gas industry because we handle huge amount of, of uh, of uh, money and, and value every day. So we may want to make sure that um, and whatever we say, we cannot repudiate. Um, so that means that blockchains are a very good solution when we're worried about other parties repudiating and saying that uh, we didn't say that or we didn't mean that or we didn't, didn't, didn't. Because then we can go back to the blockchain and say, well, on October 12th at 21.17 in, uh, or 9.17 in PM, you said the following. And then you can't really deny it because the security model of the blockchain makes it very hard to deny. Um, and also, in the, 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 the case where uh, public information, where you need to make sure that uh, the, the transaction happened at a given time and with a given, given content. For instance, if, if somebody makes a, uh, an announcement that, ensure, that has influence over the stock value of some company, you want to make sure that your trades happen after the, um, the, the announcements were made so that you don't get busted for insider trading. That went me a uh, perfectly good example of, of, an, of some, a time where you actually want to make sure that things happen in a certain order. Um, in transactions where we need to worry about repudiation or proving the timing, well, maybe it's not a uh, blockchain problem. There are things like that. How many views did you have on your YouTube channel? When did they view it? Well, we don't really care because uh, it doesn't really matter to us. So that means that uh, using blockchain to, to secure which viewer you had in which order on your YouTube videos doesn't really compute. So you have to pay attention to non-repudiation to make sure that whatever you're trying to do has an element of trust and worry about the denial, denial afterwards. Smart contracts. Um, if you look at uh, some of the hype around, especially around Ethereum, um, Ethereum is what next generation blockchains, where you can say that you can add behavior. With Bitcoin, the behavior is decided by the, by the developers. So that it's the developers that determine how Bitcoin should behave. In uh, Ethereum, you can add your own code. Um, and uh, the code uh, and the, that resulting behavior uh, poses a serious security risk to, to, to both you and all the other participants in the network. And you have to evaluate them really carefully. Uh, I don't know if any of you have heard about the DAO heist, which was in the summer of uh, 2016, where an error in the smart code of uh, uh, of a venture capital initiative on the Ethereum platform had a bug that let you withdraw much more money that you could uh, that you had put in. So if you had put in one million dollars or ten thousand dollars, you could still withdraw all of the money and the fun. And somebody figured that out because the code is public, so you can actually analyze it for uh, other people's mistakes as well. And so they managed to, uh, to make off with a lot of money. And this is why we today have um, Ethereum and Ethereum Classic. Because when that happened, um, they forked the Ethereum chain. So that somebody continued with the old chain where this had happened. And somebody said, well, uh, we didn't like it. So we just roll back to before. And then we go off in a different direction. And, uh, and so therefore, that, and, and so therefore uh, um, there are two versions of history. One uh, on the Ethereum platform, one where the Ethereum, uh, where the DAO hack happened, and one where it didn't. 
which is interesting in its own right. Um, and so when we evaluate, and especially at this time, uh, when we evaluate uh, blockchain proposals and, and the ideas around them, we look at what are you intending the smart contracts to do. Um, if it's simple uh, and testable, uh, then it's usually very suitable. It's c kind of if I, if I lend you money and you pay me back, I give you the, uh, the IOU. Perfectly, perfectly simple, usually only a few lines of code to make that happen on a, on a smart contract. Uh, <clears throat> and those are, and then you can make proper analysis on them and make sure that they are closed and the security is good and all of these things. Um, and it should be based on open source. If you can't really read the code, then I wouldn't trust the blockchain. Um, and there are some companies out there that have proprietary uh, blockchain smart contracts. Nah, skeptic. Um, there are some other uh, transactions that you can use, but then you have to be good at it because if it's semi-complex behavior or simple transactions with um, uh, semi-complex behavior with open source code or uh, simple behavior with closed source or proprietary code, then you could also, then you could also consider using blockchain. Uh, but if it's, um, it turns to be very complicated or very non-simple transactions, which are not based on uh, open source, or if it's complex in itself, or uh, based on proprietary closed source code, then I would just stay away from it, because the risks are currently too high. And one of the things about blockchains is there is no jurisdictions. So you can't really go anywhere either to complain. You can complain to the developers, of course, but uh, they might just say, oh, well. Uh, so if you lose your money, um, then it's lost. It's not like you can go to the police because the police have no jurisdiction over the internet. Uh, and you can't really force anything. Uh, the last, uh, the last um, uh, thing that, the last aspect that we are evaluating is around timing. Uh, as we mentioned, the consensus algorithms and the time of work, they are quite complicated. Uh, if you look at Bitcoin, the, the Bitcoin uh, proof of work algorithm is designed in a way so that it takes 10 minutes to run. So it always takes on average around 10 minutes um, and that means that and each block in the in the bitcoin uh, uni uh, bitcoin world can only have about 1800 transactions or so so that means that on the bitcoin platform you can only have uh, around five to seven transactions per second and that does not give you a good global performance. Um, and if you have been following the, the Bitcoin uh, craziness for the, some time, you will see that sometimes the, the, the backlog, backlog of transactions are so huge that it takes three days or more to run through all of the transactions. And if you then keep adding more and more transactions, then you will get an, uh, an ever-growing backlog of transactions, which means that you are basically working in a way that is uh, uh, where, where you don't have control. So it's not secure enough. Um, and that means that if you are having long-running transactions with, with no volume or you don't really have the need to have it verified uh, immediately, then it's a good idea. Uh, if you have high, tra high transaction volumes of more than five transactions per second um, or where you need immediate verification, then you uh, shouldn't use blockchains today. It might change. There are work underway on most of the major platforms to increase scalability and increase transaction performance and everything, but we haven't seen it yet and we don't really know about the security because some of it requires fundamental changes to the underlying trust and security model of the platform. And we don't really know what it's going to be like. And that means that you should be really, really, really careful about uh, trusting it until it has been properly verified. Um, uh, and it take, today it takes about one hour to get, or at least, it takes at least one hour, but sometimes as much as 72 hours to get your transactions verified 
on, on the Bitcoin and Ethereum networks. Um, and that's a long time in the business uh, because uh, if I sell an oil cargo to somebody, I want to have that trans and I want that ownership to be transferred immediately, <coughs> not in three days, because the promise is that it should be done immediately. So uh, I have now I have gone through uh, some of the work that we have done in Statoil over the past 18 months. Uh, and giving you both an example of what blockchain is and how we can use it or what we are using it for, but most importantly, how we are evaluating all of the different proposals that are coming towards us. Um, so I hope you found it useful, uh, but I think we have time for questions. Absolutely, time for questions. Lots and lots. Um, question, uh, Harald, if you have, I don't know, a bunch of the use cases, uh, how many of them percent are in percent went through your evaluation and passed the very suitable you know, criteria? Um, well, I think we have, we have a, a pipeline. Uh, and if I remember correctly, there are four or five that are all the way through so that we have found out that they are actually good ideas. Uh, and we have uh, about 20 or so that we're currently evaluating. And I think uh, some of them will not make it through because uh, it's, uh, well, internally inside the Statile blockchain, I mean, uh, you don't really, you don't really need it to become trustworthy because Statile trusts itself, at least for the time being. Uh, but uh, so I would say maybe 20% of the proposals are, are valid in this, uh, in this uh, particular, according to these criteria. Any more? So you were talking about public blockchains, I think, exclusively. Yes. Have Statoil also looked at a permissioned blockchain? Because you're a very big player in the market, yes. so you could, you know. Um, and uh, yes, we have people. looked at some of the permissioned blockchain. There is, uh, I think, a special edition or whatever of of Ethereum, for mm, instance, and cool. then you have uh, uh, Hyperledger Fabric or some mm. of the Hyperledger platforms uh, and uh, R3 from Corda. Mm. Uh, which are um, which are permission where you are controlling who gets into it, and that means that you that means that basically you're breaking some of the security models. You're breaking especially the proof of work and the consensus, uh, but you can do it because you have put the legal work in place uh, so that you can uh, you t you can mitigate the risks of of not using a, a public blockchain. Um, and of course, in a permission blockchain, or not of course, but in a permission blockchain, um, de depending a little on the platform, um, the, most of the transactions would still be visible to the participants. The, the, the participants on the inside would still see a lot, whereas people on the outside might, might not see as much. But, uh, uh, so you still need to, to, to have an eye on transparency. Um, in uh, Hyperledger Fabric, you have this concept of channels uh, where you can send messages, messages from, if we were trading, we could send messages and nobody else would see it. But of course, that quickly scales because that means that you have an N-square number of channels based on the number of participants. So if uh, it works for 50 participants because then you only have uh, two and a half thousand channels, but uh, if you get around to a thousand or two thousand participants, you have millions and millions of channels, and we don't know yet how well that scales um, uh, at the moment. But we have looked at it, and, and the, the bill of lading example is uh, some of those are on, on permission blockchains. Okay, thanks, Michael. I was just wondering if you could help me uh, understand uh, the behaviors uh, and give some examples of that. I think it was like two slides previous. Yes. Uh, okay. So behavior. Um, behavior is basically code that you can write that are embedded into the block on the blockchain. Um, uh, and one example is that if I, if we did this on the blockchain, uh, we, we went out to dinner and I paid, and so you issued an IOU to me saying that uh, you owe me, whatever, $25 for dinner. Um, and then uh, the smart contract, we, there might be a smart contract there that says that when you pay me back, 
I return the IOU to you. So that's a very simple example, example of behavior. Um, and the, ch the, the changes from blockchain platforms version one, like Bitcoin, to version two or generation two, like Ethereum, is that in the first Block, blockchains like Bitcoin and those, um, uh, the, it was the developers that determined the behavior. But Ethereum and Corda and Hyperledger and these, they come with uh, their own programming languages. So you can write it in Kotlin or Go or, or some Java uh, Solidity, I think, for Ethereum, which is a Java dialect. Um, and of course, that introduces all kinds of, of, uh, of inter interesting security risk because then your security on the blockchain is dependent on the skill of the developers that you have. Um, and it has turned out to be quite difficult. Uh, in, in, the, um, in, the, in, in those particular examples that we have been looking at, we have also been looking at something like uh, automated uh, interest calculations and uh, and so or or so that y you pay pay an interest every day so all of these things are automated uh, instead of, of being manual processes yes time for one more if we have it no? okay thank you very much